tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Get the f out of here. Caught on camera, a man threatens to stab a city councillor at a Vancouver homeless camp. Stab you, buddy, so quick. Also, there were times where uh, my instructor went on holidays and I was like just in the home doing nothing for like a month or two. Not cleared for takeoff. You're going to court? They are. A Fraser Valley Flight School defends itself as several student pilots demand a refund and... And if you're roaming the beaches, just ensuring everybody's safety right now. The plea to prevent another long weekend COVID-19 surge in Kelowna as BC reports 50 new cases. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Tensions are running high tonight in Vancouver's Strathcona neighborhood, where a homeless camp is growing. There was a heated dispute there this morning involving a city councillor. And as the CBC's John Hernandez reports, the whole incident was caught on camera. Get the f out of here. Look at this. Tensions flared early in the day. This heated argument filmed by Strathcona resident Kimberly Allen moments after she saw a man using drugs just meters away from her front door. Uh, I asked him to leave calmly. Um, he proceeded to get very angry and sort of uh, he stood up to come towards me. I moved out of the way fast. Vancouver City Councillor Pete Fry, seen here, just happened to be walking by and stepped in. With, uh, he threatened me with a knife but didn't actually produce a knife so I wasn't too concerned for my personal safety but I was concerned for safety of, of my neighbors because there are a number of kids who live on that block. Fry says incidents like this are mounting. This week alone, reports of a gun found in a nearby park, needles thrown at residents, and a child picked up and shaken by an unknown man at a popular city water park. Uh, we do have officers who do have an increased presence in that area. Safety concerns traced back to this growing encampment, which emerged just days after a tent city at Crab Park was shut down. So it's created this sort of confluence of, of activity in the park and as a result it's drawn a lot of traffic from the downtown east side through the neighborhood of Strathcona. This connecting street now dubbed the highway through hell. The patience and compassion of the neighborhood frayed. The taxpayer hasn't, his rights have not been protected. We don't have safe streets. We don't have clean streets. No one wants to deal with the issue of homelessness. You have 350 people living precariously sheltered in a park. But I do believe support is required for these people. I do believe they need to be relocated. Everyone here is somebody's child. As for those who call this place home, they say they're willing to leave as long as there's somewhere to go. I also think that it's the time for the federal government and the provincial government and the municipality to step up and start identifying those sorts of government lands that can be created for people to be able to shelter in place so it's not a park. Mounting conflicts with both sides begging for help. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Vancouver police are searching for a suspect and looking for witnesses after an overdose prevention society worker died Monday after being stabbed in a fistfight. Officers responded around 8.30 p.m. to calls of a man suffering from a knife wound at Thurlow and Comox Street behind St. Paul's Hospital. Crews took 41-year-old Thomas Dunahee to hospital where he died. He had been working that night at the prevention site attached to St. Paul's and the society's director, Sarah Blythe, says he was one of the kindest volunteers they've ever had. She estimates he saved hundreds of lives. She says Dunahee would walk Vancouver's streets and alleys, often alone at night, to make sure someone did an overdose alone. Anyone with information on the incident is asked to contact police. A group of international flight students is pushing a Fraser Valley Aviation School for tuition refunds. The four want their money back after they say training didn't go as expected. The students from Nigeria and Pakistan enrolled at Bluebird Flight Academy in Chilliwack. As Bell Peary of the CBC's Impact Team reports, the school denies the students' claims that they didn't get what they were promised. <laughs> Plans to pilot planes stalled for a group of international students, they say, once they landed at Bluebird Flight Academy. The last time I flew was November last year. 
The four claim endless training delays, allegedly due to not enough aircraft, a high turnover of instructors, and unclear vacation scheduling. There were times where my instructor went on holidays, and I was like just sitting at home doing nothing for like a month or two. Then he comes back, we do the old training all from the start. Whenever you switch to a new teacher, he wants some time, some days so to know about your progress, to know about your position, where you at. It just keep on costing me more. Flight school tuition is based on the number of hours a student actually flies a plane. Jaspreet Sodi speaks for Bluebird. Hi, Jaspreet, you there? He declined an on-camera interview. Then why if a refund lawsuit? is due, they will get the refund. If there is no refund due, then we can't really do much about it. We cannot provide them a refund on a service they've already taken. Sodi says the school is currently not offering flight training because of the pandemic. Transport Canada says Bluebird Flight Academy didn't hold a valid operating certificate between February 19th and March 20th. In an email, Sodi wrote, before COVID-19, Bluebird had four aircraft. We maintained a ratio of seven students per instructor per aircraft. He blames most of the training delays for various reasons on the students themselves. Former students have sued Bluebird for refunds three times since 2016. In each case, one which was settled, the awards were a fraction of the claim. Then why are there lawsuits? Because they believe there's a refund, but we have evidence and contracts which we are upholding by. We're going to stick with them. In January, students suspected the school had folded. The office was empty. The planes were gone. None of the students were communicated to, which was quite unprofessional. Um, not in email, not on call, nothing. It actually left us at pretty much a very bad state. Sodi says the school will be flying by mid-August. In late May, Bluebird Flight Academy changed its name to Skyhawk Aviation. The students came here for a one-year commercial pilots program. Three years and $40,000 later, Caleb Egbego still doesn't have his stripes. If I can get my money back, I'll be excited, so I go finish my training somewhere else. But if on the other hand they are not ready to refund me, I do like them to shut down this school for good. His classmates have left Bluebird to complete their flight training at other schools. Bell Puri, CBC News, Chilliwack. As we head into the long weekend, the state of BC's pandemic is a good reminder we still need to be cautious. The province announcing 50 new cases of the virus. And sadly, there has been another death in the past 24 hours, bringing the total number of deaths to 194. Of concern is another health care facility outbreak, this time at the Dania home in Burnaby. There are now active outbreaks at two long-term care homes and one acute care facility. Active cases also saw a big jump of 36, bringing the total to 278. One of the only positives, hospitalizations are unchanged, with five across the province. Two of those are in intensive care. And the beaches and wineries are open in BC's Okanagan this weekend. The sun is shining, but COVID-19 is casting a deep shadow. Last Canada Day, visitors sparked a COVID cluster that spread throughout Western Canada. Now, as Tom Popick reports, the city is trying to balance hospitality and health. Visit Kelowna this long weekend and you'll get a different welcome. So we're kind of here roaming the beaches, just ensuring everybody's safety right now. City teams are now patrolling, enforcing COVID common sense. Social distancing. <laughs> yeah. Rindeep Kaur is from Edmonton, masked and maintaining a family bubble. It's what provincial health officer Dr. Bonnie Henry wants to see. The actions you take do make a difference, and we have seen that in the last few weeks. What you do today and this weekend will determine how we are going to be able to manage in the weeks and months ahead. So let's all do the right thing. Last long weekend, hotel room parties and young visitors sparked a COVID cluster, now linked to at least 130 infections. More than 1,000 people were ordered to self-isolate. But most here are still maskless and mingling. Beaches are packed. Social media are sharing and shaming people partying on the lakes and taking risks. Kelowna City staff have responded to more than 600 public complaints about COVID infractions and social distancing. Most were handled by information and some warnings. But so far, not a single fine. For Kelowna Mayor Colin Bazrin, this weekend is a tough test. The city is deferring to the province's authority. She's the one in control here. She's the one in charge. And she doesn't believe that there needs to be different rules for Kelowna than the rest of the province. And we agree with that. 
Hotels are booked solid this weekend. Main chains have imposed mandatory mask rules on their own and are deep cleaning. Patios and restaurants are on alert. For cruise operator Mike Redicliffe, All of our corporate events are gone. All of our wedding weddings are gone. Weekends like this are make or break. He is cancelling party cruises and limiting passengers to comply with new provincial rules announced Monday. Redcliffe says more crackdowns won't solve COVID risks. It's not going to stop things. People are going to find a way to go and party on a boat that's not as relevant as our boats. Um, other houseboats, uh, other smaller boats, uh, it's gonna, they're going to happen. For now, warnings and worries will have to do. Risking a second cluster, Kelowna is trying to balance health and hospitality. Tom Popic, CBC News, Kelowna. Frustration tonight for BC Ferries passengers and those still hoping to book travel ahead of the long weekend. Sailings are filling up well ahead of their departure times, and the company's website has been down for hours, so a clear sense of when travelers might be able to make a reservation is difficult to come by. But here's what we can tell you. To us and to Schwartz Bay, 7 p.m. sailing was 90% full by 4 o'clock. Tawasin to Duke Point's 815 sailing was more than 90% full by 2.30. And Horseshoe Bay to Departure Bay's 750 sailing was 60% full before 2 o'clock. So if you're looking to get to a spot tonight, that could mean a long wait. While the BC Ferries website is still down, their Twitter page is updating regularly. And BC Hydro is reminding people to be honest with themselves when it comes to their swimming abilities. A new report released in time for the BC Day Long Weekend shows many British Columbians aren't as prepared for the water as they might think. The utility manages about 20 wreck sites in the province, 10 of which have swimming areas. That includes Bunsen Lake, where there were two accidental drownings in 2018. BC Hydro says 85% of people surveyed consider themselves experienced swimmers, but 60% say they don't swim more than a few times each year. We just want to take every precaution we can uh, to warn British Columbians that, you know, when you do go swimming, when you do recreate uh, on our reservoirs at our rec sites, there are risks and uh, there are steps you can take to mitigate those risks. BC Hydro says to avoid tragedy in the water, don't mix swimming and boating with drugs and alcohol. Always wear a personal flotation device and obey the signs. Dozens of mothers and family members affected by BC's overdose crisis rallied outside the Ministry of Health's office today in Victoria. The group wants to bring attention to the record-breaking number of overdose deaths announced in May and June. My daughter has been in active addiction here in Victoria for the past 12 years. And through that journey, we've learned that there is no help for a person struggling. Advocacy group Moms Stop the Harm fears if the provincial and federal governments don't act quickly, more people will overdose and die. The group supports Dr. Bonnie Henry's recommendation made last spring of decriminalization of drugs for personal use. This is also something the Premier has pushed for, writing a letter to the Prime Minister earlier this month asking him to come up with a national plan. BC saw 175 overdose-related deaths in June. The federal government is asking consumers in five provinces to throw away any red onions that might have come from the U.S. over concerns about salmonella. The Public Health Agency of Canada is advising individuals in B.C., Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Ontario not to eat any red onions imported to Canada from the U.S. Consumers are also being urged to avoid food that contains raw red onions imported from the states. The agency believes the onions are likely linked to an outbreak of salmonella Newport illness. It has affected 114 people in our country. American and Canadian officials are working to try to identify the source of the outbreak. BC Hydro says it has serious concerns about the Site C Dam project as a result of the pandemic and other challenges. The Crown Corps president says even before COVID-19 struck, an unforeseen need for foundation work, contract modification, and First Nations treaty infringement claims were all complicating factors. And now, the minister responsible for the project says the pandemic is creating new pressures on the project's budget and schedule. I am very concerned by these reports, particularly as they relate to cost and schedule uncertainties. I think we can all appreciate that COVID-19 has created challenges that none of us could have foreseen a few months ago. 
The dam was projected to be at full capacity by 2024. That date is now up in the air. BC Hydro says it's reviewing project costs and timelines and provide an update in the fall. The weather update is brought to you by Fortis BC. Using more energy these days, we've got energy saving tips, easy upgrades, how-to videos, and more. Well, the long weekend is here, and so is Johanna Wagstaff with our forecast. Uh, I think in your email to the newsroom this morning, you said that the, uh, the showers that we got were caused by a pocket of instability, but that seems to have gone away now. Thank you for reading my morning emails, <laughs> Mike. I appreciate that. Yes, it, it was a very exciting morning for me, tracking thunderstorms uh, pre 9 a.m. Very rare for the south coast. We had a little system push up from the south. Uh, we saw some good downpours in uh, Langley and Maple Ridge. The island got a light show that you haven't seen in years. Uh, but yeah, that was it, uh, dissipating and getting back to the sun. Speaking of lightning, though, a uh, developing situation tonight in the interior. That same line that we saw is pushing inland and sparking up new fires. I want to take you to the fire danger rating right now. Uh, you can see high to extreme across a huge swath of the province, the red in the extreme area, really building in through uh, the Kootenays. Uh, what I'm watching right now, again, see all of those lightning strikes throughout the day that has been sparking up new fires. I've been watching the, the BC fire map and things have been firing up Southern Okanagan, the uh, Caribou region. Uh, but the BC uh, Fire Centre just tweeting that they are actually having trouble identifying new fires because of all the haze in the area. And folks in Kelowna are sending me a message saying it does smell smoky. These fires are coming from Washington and Montana. So there may be more fires than we realize. Uh, all that being said, it is going to be a hot weekend, and I want to talk more about our weekend forecast, but uh, BC Fire Centre asking people to be diligent over the next few days. Yeah, Joe, a great reminder to uh, enjoy the sunshine, but still be fire smart. We'll check back with you in a little bit. A new Westminster senior's green thumb has put his balcony plants at the centre of a fight over aesthetics. Antonio Vieira has been growing plants for food for many, many years, but Recently, his building's property manager told him to cut things back. And as Mira Baines reports, the gardener is looking for some compassion. 73-year-old Antonio Vieira's plants are his joy. Where I feel bad, I cried. Eh? It's all wrong, telling me to get rid of my plants. Vieira has been growing vegetables and herbs and planters on his balcony every year for six years. But now he's been told to clear out the tall plants because of how his balcony suite looks. My neighbors all like my, my balcony. They said my balcony looks the best around here. He treasures his tomatoes used to make his daily sandwich. Vieira suffers from Machado Joseph disease, which causes his muscles to be weak and rigid. His plants give him comfort. Last week, he received a letter from Martello Property Services, which manages his suite. In the letter, property manager Heidi Shortreed said, as it is required that the exterior of the building maintains a uniform look, we request that you please remove the tallest plants on the balcony by Wednesday, July 29th at 5 p.m. and that you refrain from allowing the plants to grow higher than the balcony railing in the future. We all Portuguese immigrants like to have plants. I have Roman beans, the taller ones, Roman beans and tomatoes, the taller ones. The other ones, the short ones are Portuguese herbs for tea. Vieira's story was posted on Facebook, prompting numerous people to ask the company to cut him a break, rather than his plants. When CBC News contacted Martello Property Services, manager Heidi Shortreed said that Vieira had spoken to her and explained that the plants are seasonal. She said the company wasn't aware that he was growing tomatoes and beans. She says she doesn't see that as an issue, but it's up to the building owner. It's unclear how this will end. Vieira says he just wants to harvest his vegetables this growing season. After that, he plans to throw out the seasonal plants as he does every year. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. And some good news for Antonio and those who supported him. The building manager reached out to CBC after we shot that story, saying she's received many messages from people concerned for Antonio and explaining the benefits of gardening for seniors, so he'll be allowed to keep his garden just as it is. Very good. Common sense prevails. I have to see that. <laughs> Just a reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app.
CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Follow both of us and Johanna on Instagram and Twitter as well. Uh, hoping to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in Canada? Well, now there's an app for that. Coming up with the federal government is counting on for it to be successful. Thanks for staying with us online during our regular TV commercial break. Well, a piper on Prince Edward Island thinks he may have the prescription for boosting spirits during the pandemic. As CBC's Nancy Russell found out, he's calling it vitamin B, and he's been dispensing it virtually, of course, for the past few months. These days, James McCaddy and his family are out and about exploring Prince Edward Island on a summer staycation as all of their usual Highland games are cancelled. But in mid-March, when the lockdown started, McCaddy went online with his bagpipes. Every day for the foreseeable future, I'm going to be putting up a brief video uh, piping. We're going to call it vitamin B, vitamin bagpipe. I was thinking, well, maybe it'll be 25 or so, but we were also naive back then. The first video recorded in the empty theater at the College of Piping. Then he started recording his videos at home and four-year-old daughter Briar insisted on joining in. The shares and likes on social media poured in from around the world. And it's not even people who are played bagpipes, it's people who just wanted some something happy. There were also lots of fans on Prince Edward Island, including Mary Beth Campbell, who watched the videos daily along with the family dog. Music is just therapy to so many people. Um, seeing those videos and a sweet little girl dancing just brings cheer into everyone's lives. The videos were a family affair. Kylie McCaddy, also a piping instructor, joined in for episode 102 for a family march around the kitchen. It was Briar's favorite episode. Because my mom came to daddy's from my mom came to mommy's back. I think it's really nice how it's connected with people. And like James said, it was connected with people all over the world. Briar's got her own little fan club now. She said people send her stuff in the mail. <laughs> James McCaddy wrapped up the daily videos at episode 105, but there are still occasional posts and lots of memories. I think it'll be a great source of embarrassment for Briar later. But then if she gets beyond the teenage years, then I think she'll look at it really fondly. I'm already nostalgic about it. Uh, because the, the few months have felt like a short time, but they've also felt like years. I'm the Highlanders and the last fan. And it's just watching my daughter grow, so it, it means a great deal to me personally. McCaddy plans to be back teaching at the College of Piping in the fall, but he knows he has lots of vitamin B to fall back on whenever he needs it. Nancy Russell, CBC News, Charlottetown. Nothing like a little vitamin B, right? No, I loved her dancing. Yeah, dancing. <laughs> Very fantastic. cute. You know, uh, and I, I don't think I've ever encountered anybody who doesn't like the bagpipes. Our neighbor, who's a great piper, has been uh, playing them at 7 o'clock every night. To That's right. To frontline health care worker. Yeah, we had that on the show. It was great. All right, uh, back in just a couple of seconds with what's making news around North America. Stay right here. Now the Prime Minister has unveiled a new smartphone app hoping to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Right now, COVID Alert only works in Ontario. Now, the federal government is hoping to expand its reach across the country. However, as Ashley Burke explains, the app's success and effectiveness depend heavily on how many people actually use it. I've downloaded the app this morning, and I encourage you to do the same. This is Canada's long-awaited app to help the fight against COVID-19. COVID Alert will notify users who've been in close contact with someone who has tested positive, if they have the app too. The more people use it, the better it can trace and therefore slow the spread of the virus. In fact, health experts say that if enough people sign up, this app can help prevent future outbreaks of COVID-19 in Canada. COVID Alert doesn't collect any personally identifiable information. The app doesn't save your location, address, or any personal information. 
avoid higher risk activities. Officials say it's a tool to alert people faster if they've potentially been exposed. A certain setting where you don't actually know who is around you necessarily, they're not part of your social bubble. Under those kind of settings, it's actually quite useful to be able to uh, have an app where you can download this specific key if you've got a lab positive, and that sort of sends a, 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 a signal to the people who have been within uh, that two meter distance. The app is voluntary and so far only functional in Ontario, raising questions about if there will be enough uptake for it to make a difference. Similar apps have been rolled out in other countries. One expert said they haven't had a major impact. And really, what it can do is assist finding if you have been exposed at some point in time. It's not a guarantee. There are all kinds of limitations around the technology and it cannot keep you safe. It can, after the fact of exposure, maybe help us when we're doing the actual hard work of contact tracing to prevent further exposure. The federal government says it's working to roll out the app in Atlantic Canada next and hopes to get other provinces up and running in weeks, but doesn't have a deal yet. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. The sweeping ban on foreign travelers entering Canada has now been extended until at least the end of August. The order has been in place since mid-March. It bars nearly all those who are not Canadian citizens or permanent residents who are coming from a foreign country other than the U.S. Now, a separate order in place between Canada and the states prohibits all non-essential travel. Truckers and healthcare workers are among those still allowed to enter from the U.S. Air Canada is posting some huge losses. The airline says its second quarter took a staggering $1.7 billion hit. It's all because of the pandemic-related slump in travel. Revenue fell by almost 90% between April 1st and the end of June, compared to the same period last year. The airline is slowly starting to gear up again. It's flying to 91 destinations this summer, but that's about double the routes flown in May. But it's still only half of the routes Air Canada usually services. Well, COVID-19 continues to surge in the U.S. with the total number of deaths topping 150,000. As Lindsay Duncombe reports, Dr. Anthony Fauci and other experts have been answering questions from a special congressional committee investigating the pandemic. Watching this hearing play out on Capitol Hill, there is a sense of a tale of two pandemics, depending on which lawmaker from which party is asking the questions of these medical experts. From the Democrats, you get a sense of a disaster unfolding, much criticism of the Trump administration's response. From the Republicans, the opposite, much praise for how the Trump administration is handling this. The, the experts themselves are being a diplomatic in his opening statement dr anthony fauci talked about the possibility of a vaccine he described it as promising we hope that as a time we get into the late fall and early winter we will have in fact a vaccine that we can say would be safe and effective one can never guarantee the safety or effectiveness unless you do the trial but we are cautiously optimistic that this will be successful we can expect many questions about testing because what's happening in the United States right now is testing is going up. There are a lot more tests being performed, but the issue is it's taking a long time for some people to get those test results, in some cases a week or even two weeks. And that makes it difficult to do contract tracing and find out who else may potentially be infected. In his opening statements, the man responsible for the testing response in the United States said this. We cannot test our way out of this or any other pandemic. Testing does not replace personal responsibility. It does not substitute for avoiding crowded indoor spaces or washing hands or wearing a mask. One of the first questions to Dr. Fauci was about why the situation in Europe, which is seeing a flattening of its curve in many countries, and the situation in the United States with increasing cases in many areas, why they're so different. Uh, Dr. Fauci's answer to that was uh, about the difference in how the nations shut down. Uh, there were stronger closures, stronger lockdowns in many European countries. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Hong Kong is postponing September's election by a year. 
saying it's necessary because of COVID-19. Coming up, why opponents believe the vote is actually being delayed. with George McLean. Canada's recession is being weathered better by some than others. All it takes is a million dollar yacht and a $15,000 entry fee and a race to Hawaii. Jerry Thompson has this report. For most of these people, sailing is a way of life, a habit they cannot avoid regardless of weather or downturns in the economy. The 12-man crew of this 54-foot yacht from Seattle includes three architects, a marine engineer, a retired baseball player, and the skipper is the chief justice of the Supreme Court in Washington State. I guess my thought would be do the things that are important to you and find a way to do it. A careful skipper leaves nothing to chance. He'll even hire a diver to check the bottom of the boat, give the hull one last scrub before departure. When he's not racing, Skipper Don Wilson is a roofing contractor in Sydney, B.C. Well, this is just a neat way to get away from it all, sort of. And I said, take it easy. <laughs> Ten Canadian boats are racing against 23 Americans, including one from Sun Valley, Idaho. That's the boat that's going to win. <laughs> How do you get a boat from Sun Valley, Idaho to the West Coast? It's hard. <laughs> So it's all fun and games now, but can you imagine it about midnight tonight with 40-foot swells, a blowing rainstorm in mid-Pacific? Just a heck of a way to spend the recession. After the Hawaiian blessing of the fleet, the yachts line up at the mouth of Victoria Harbor and prepare to face over 2,300 nautical miles of ocean. Actually, this is one of the few places where bad weather is good news. The winner is the one who figures out how to slide around the storm and use the bad weather to push across the ocean. It'll take 12 to 14 days, and the weather in Maui is always sunny. Jerry Thompson, CBC News, Victoria. And to recap our top story, the ceasefire in Beirut was broken today. Israeli gunners exchanged fire with Palestinian fighters, and the Israelis tightened their siege around the western half of the city. And that's The National for Saturday, July 3rd. For CBC News, I'm George McClain. Good night. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Get the f out of here, Go. I'm you. Go. A Vancouver City Councilor was just trying to help a neighbor who was being harassed when a man threatened to stab him. It's believed the man lives in the Strathcona tent city. Residents of that area want the province and federal government to finance a solution. None of the students were communicated to which is quite unprofessional, not in email, not on call, nothing. A group of international flight students is pushing a Fraser Valley Aviation School for tuition refunds. They want their money back after they say training didn't go as expected. The students from Nigeria and Pakistan enrolled at Bluebird Flight Academy in Chilliwack. The school denies student claims that they didn't get what they were promised. Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry is reporting 50 new cases of COVID-19 in BC today. There's also one new death, bringing our province's total to 195. Five people are in hospital, two in intensive care. Public health teams continue to monitor the active outbreaks on Haida Gwaii and at Fraser Valley Packers. 
And as we head into the long weekend here in BC, health officials are reminding people to keep groups small. As Greg Rasmussen reports, the effort now is to avoid another post long weekend bump. Sun, sand, football, enough to make it all seem almost normal. But these 18 year olds are keeping to a small bubble. In public, we're not going up to strangers and yeah. keeping, but within, within, our, within our friend group, we're pretty liberal. Definitely challenging, but like, I guess you just adapt to it. Some are worried about people taking greater risks. We built up all these good social distancing rules and precautions, and now that's just, that's just gone, which is kind of upsetting because I know we take it seriously, and it just seems like others don't. Officials fear the combination of a sunny long weekend and the lure of large social gatherings will cause people to drop their guard. Let's make this long weekend a different one than what we saw in early July. The worry is a repeat of events like this one earlier this month. A poster advertising a large beach party for tonight has BC's health minister upset. I think people do need to give their head a shake a little bit here. To keep people in line, the city of Kelowna is putting teams on the streets. We're kind of here roaming the beaches, just ensuring everybody's safety right now. Using reminders rather than fines or arrests. Yeah, it's just not possible to have enforcement or bylaw officers um, uh, everywhere uh, where people are gathering in our community. While some are calling for a crackdown, softer educational nudges may be more effective. If you lead with enforcement, then you push the behaviors underground. And the worst thing we could do is cause an outdoor party to move indoors. That would be much more dangerous. At the beach, a call for vigilance. A lot of people are doing the right things and trying to make the effort to take precautions. And there's a lot of people that are kind of just ignoring everything and doing what they want to do and pretending like COVID's over, but it's still, you know, a reality that we need to face every day. A reality that will last far longer than this long weekend. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. The government is extending the rent relief program for small business owners. It's been heavily criticized for putting the onus on landlords to apply instead of simply giving money to tenants. As Peter Armstrong explains, many of whom say they'll go under without radical changes. George Ed Carter is one of the lucky ones. Her business is open and her landlord applied for rent relief. Carter is only doing a fraction of the business she'd normally do, so the rent relief has been crucial. Right now we're operating on a part-time basis. That's a huge impact for us and with the, with the rent reduction program, it definitely eliminates a lot of that pressure. For those who accessed it, the program's been a lifeline, but only a small handful of businesses have actually been given a break on rent. The current system requires applicants to prove they've lost 70% of their revenue and it puts all the power in the hands of the landlords, many of whom just haven't bothered to apply for the program leaving their tenants without any options. Small business survival really depends on a better, more inclusive rent relief program being rolled out quickly. One that helps tenants get relief even if landlords haven't cooperated and won't ever. About half a million businesses should qualify, but just 63,000 have actually received money. So hundreds of thousands of business owners are watching the bills pile up with no relief in sight. Since COVID and the landlord refused, I just decide to give up. Jin Lee runs the Chinese Arts and Crafts Store, a mainstay of Vancouver's Chinatown. Her landlord's demanding months worth of rent, and she's only just reopened. I am cried. Yeah. I cried many times, yeah. but yeah, because it's sad. Nobody can help me. Community advocates like Michael Tan say this is a growing problem. He says smaller businesses don't have lobbyists and lawyers to help them navigate the system. And even though shops have reopened, hardly any of them are operating at full capacity. The need is urgent. I mean, we've already seen this announcement of Chinese art crafts. They'll be closing in September. That leaves us two months to find some sort of remedy for them. And or else they will be the first of many. And if there is a wave of closures, it's small shops like these that make up the fabric of towns and neighborhoods that'll be the first to go. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. With COVID-19 cases surging, Hong Kong has moved to postpone local elections that were set to take place in September. But as Sasha Petrasek tells us tonight, pro-democracy campaigners say the pandemic 
is being used to suppress opposition. Late on Friday in Hong Kong, along with the rain, the political storm intensified with the announcement by government leader Carrie Lam. Legislative elections to be delayed by a year to make the vote safe from COVID, she says. Infections here have doubled in the past month, but they still sit at just over 3,000, low compared to much of the world. And for many in Hong Kong, it's just an excuse. They suspect political motives by the Chinese Communist Party, Lam's backers in Beijing. I knew the government wouldn't let us vote, she says. It's disappointing. After more than a year of pro-democracy protests, Beijing is spooked by the prospect of a big win by opposition candidates, giving them a legislative majority. They've already disrupted government plans in council chambers, and they have big support among voters who came out en masse in recent primaries. So now Beijing is using a tough new national security law imposed on Hong Kong a month ago to crack down, disqualifying a dozen popular opposition candidates. However, in order to safeguard the city's future, Hong Kongers will not surrender and our resistance will continue arresting prominent student leaders in the middle of the night in Hong Kong, issuing warrants for those who have fled to oppose China from abroad. I'm just representing um, a large portion of Hong Kong people who are in support of our autonomy and democracy. And now the election delay. It's been condemned by the U.S., the U.K. and others. But as far as China's concerned, whatever it does in Hong Kong is no longer anyone else's business. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Muslims across the world are preparing to celebrate Eid al-Adha, but under very different circumstances. Coming up, how the pandemic has changed prayer and traditions. 641, there's a live shot of Tofino tonight. A little beach volleyball going on there, some surfing. And we did get a few showers on the south coast today, thanks to a pocket of instability as joe calls it but things have stabilized and it's looking good for the long weekend the forecast is next
I'm CBC journalist Will Fundal, and I'm non-binary. But what exactly does that mean? We'll answer some of the gender questions you always wanted to ask in our new podcast, They and Us. Listen now. The weather update is brought to you by Fortis BC. Using more energy these days? We've got energy-saving tips, easy upgrades, how-to videos, and more. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now with the forecast. Joe, you're watching a big storm bearing down the east coast of North America. Tell us more. That's right. This storm already cutting a swath through the uh, Bahamas over the past 24 hours uh, as it continues to spin at Category 1 status. And it has its eyes set first on the Grand Bahamas tonight and then Florida for tomorrow night. I want to show you pictures out of Florida as uh, residents prepare for a possible landfall tomorrow night. This storm is a category one strength already making records uh, for the earliest eye storm on record so far this season. Uh, and it has, as I mentioned, already brought severe flooding to, to the Dominican Republic as well as Puerto Rico, where one death was reported. Uh, Folks are getting prepared for what could be three to seven days without power. That's what officials are asking uh, people to prepare for. And COVID testing sites have been temporarily shut. Most of them are tents and uh, need to be taken down. Watch as this storm tracks northwestward through the next 24 hours. Best chance of landfall Saturday night as a Category 1 storm. Second scenario, it slides up that east coast, also causing uh, big flooding and uh, strong winds. So watching that very closely, that's going to be a big weekend storm for Florida. And uh, we'll keep you posted through the weekend and into early next week. Taking you back to the west side, uh, we have that band of instability I'm tracking closely, bringing those thunderstorms to the interior and starting up new wildfires. Stopping you at Saturday mid-morning, uh, we do get a bit of a break across most of the province with the exception of the northwest. Quite clear in through Vancouver, a good-looking sunny Saturday if that's what you were hoping for, and a bit of a break for the really convective uh, thunderstorms, but definitely a chance in through the interior. Uh, Sunday looking dry for the south coast as well, but look at that, Sunday mid-morning, there's a a new band of showers tracking across the island. So if you had plans to head west, uh, definitely watch for those showers Sunday. I think they'll hold off for Vancouver until Monday. Temperatures are very hot once again. That line of thunderstorms really don't break the heat uh, like we were hoping they would. So a very hot Saturday and Sunday. It's really not until Monday that the whole province will experience a bit of a cut to that humidity. And that's showing up in our forecast. Uh, a couple of 24s this weekend. I think a few more clouds Sunday than Saturday increasing as we head into the afternoon. Monday, not a washout by any means. If you had some plans, uh, showers in the morning, I think more likely. And then clearing as we head into the afternoon and that will be a much more comfortable sleep come Tuesday and Wednesday. Well, we'll look forward to all of that. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Joe. You well, today marks the Muslim holiday of Eid. It's normally celebrated with shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder prayers and feasting at mosques, but as we know, COVID-19 has changed things. The Muslim Students Association at UBC held this outdoor prayer session on campus today to celebrate the pandemic. The pandemic has forced mosques to hold strict limits on how many people can pray together and others like the group shown here are praying outside to reduce the risk of spreading the virus. CBC's Ellen Morrow shows us how Muslims in other parts of Canada celebrated safely. A day of joy changed but nowhere near dampened by COVID. We're really excited. I'm so happy to be here today. Hundreds of cars lined up to snake through this mosque parking lot. Mobile festivities with cool treats, a juggler, even animals, as this community shared a collective moment, separate in their vehicles, but still together, celebrating Eid al-Adha, one of the most important days in the Muslim calendar. We are like very lucky to have Isna here, like making like this drive through. And after months of lockdown, this celebration is all the more needed, says this father. Especially for kids, because they are so bored, like staying at home so uh, for so long time. So now, like uh, to get like out and to uh, have this fun, you know, and especially in this 
occasion, so it's very, uh, for sure, uh, very happy for this. How are you? Thank you. A similar event was held in Moncton, where eight-year-old Zachariah Samad celebrated with his dad. It is cool, but I do miss the, you know, other times, but we have to do this for safety. And in Yellowknife, to mark the occasion, a physically distanced barbecue. At this Toronto mosque, Friday prayers too came with COVID precautions as worshippers reflected on the meaning of the day. The message of, of hope, uh, the message of resiliency, you know, we are realizing uh, what's important to us and what matters to us because this pandemic, uh, there's lots of, of challenges. Many of those challenges remain. But today, at least, was a happy reprieve. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. COVID-19 shut down gay bars in queer spaces. But coming up, why it hasn't stopped a group of non-binary artists from putting on the show of a lifetime. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. 
The Vancouver Queer Film Festival is going online this year. Enjoy the best in independent queer cinema along with workshops, artist Q&As and panels, all from the comfort of your own home. Learn more at queerfilmfestival.ca and never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. Well, with queer spaces shut down due to COVID-19, putting together performances has been tough for Vancouver's drag artists. Which brings us to The Darlings, a group of non-binary artists who took it upon themselves to put together their first in-person show since February. Here's a look at what went into what they call their most ambitious presentation ever. I'm a drag artist, a non-binary, indigenous, queer drag artist um, who works on Coast Salish territory. And I'm a member of The Darlings, which is a uh, four-person non-binary drag troupe. When we started The Darlings, it was partially in response to the representation that was happening in the drag scene already. Because we knew there were people like us that weren't seeing themselves represented in drag yet. People are watching. The pandemic started, first thing everyone does is they turn to art. The effects of being a queer person in isolation is you go and you turn on your TV and it's all cisgendered straight people. And it's really, really boring and sad to not see yourself in anything you watch. And that's why people go to drag shows, because they see people like themselves and they see this vibrancy that they don't see anywhere else. Before the pandemic, we were doing drag full time. And to be honest, I had kind of just jumped off into committing to that. And we all quit our jobs, and PM quit their job too. And then this happened three months later. I cried, and then I called PM. I was just like, Desi, I. We have to do something, like we can't just freak out, like literally everything's canceled, we have to do something, we have to do a show. And they were like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and called Made in China and Rose, and was like, listen, I really think we should do this show in two weeks, and I think we should use our webcams. And that was like my first mistake with those shows. Yeah, I don't know what's happening, I, I can hear you, but I can't hear my music. Luckily, it worked out really well. The support was huge from our first broadcast, but unfortunately, it got censored. And somebody uh, reported it on Facebook, and it got taken down immediately. They deemed it as inappropriate or explicit content. That was what the descriptor was. And then, so we disputed it. Facebook put the video back up, but by that time, we had lost a huge chunk of our audience. Trying to figure out how to get it onto Vimeo right after, and then how to redirect all of our audience. So it kind of became this whole experience that ended up being kind of memorable and exciting and very specific to what we were going through. We got our second show ready, we did like a whole new media platform, we did a press release, and then that show got taken down too. And that was like a really good glimpse into the reality of what it's like to navigate the internet as a queer person. It's unfortunate, but the only spaces that provide us that safeness is queer spaces. So that's been the hardest part about losing these spaces, is because it's all we had. There was people that were literally queer and alone <laughs> for three months. And we need this, we need these spaces, we need to dance together. People think it's like brave and an act of rebellion, you know, but it's who we are. Everybody just trying to make it uh, work, which is obviously very, uh, very challenging. Yeah, and um, the Pride Parade's this Sunday, well, yes. virtual one. Yeah, Pride Weekend. So 2 o'clock, uh, the virtual parade. Uh, we'd normally be out, of course, uh, in the West yeah. End uh, participating in that. Uh, 1 o'clock uh, on VancouverPride.ca, uh, on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Yeah. 
It'll be uh, it'll be weird not to, to not to see the floats and, and to take part in it, but it's good that they're doing it online. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a reminder: you can always watch this newscast online at cbc.ca/bc. Our next uh, local newscast is right here. Did I do it right? Yeah, I did it right. Tina's here at 11 after the national. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Happy Friday. See you later. Bye.